Thank you very much. Uh, this is a really important uh, series here, Associate Professor Celebration. Uh, and we organize about three per year from Arvin's office. Uh, so he is uh, traveling right now uh, to a global location for the wonderful work he's also doing on the side with USAID and so on. So uh, you've got the substitute. I hope you can bear with me for two minutes just to show uh, the uh, deep appreciation uh, for the tenure system here. And a uh, huge congratulations to those who received tenure uh, in recent years. Uh, we started this as one of the feedback from the faculty members and graduate students, postdocs, uh, is that uh, we should uh, uh, feature our recently tenured associate professors uh, and uh, congratulate them on their early retirement, I mean, uh, on their uh, uh, having the platform to dream big, aim higher, uh, and think outside of the box, uh, and to maximize the benefits of this highly unusual system in the labor market called tenure uh, that we hold with great pride. Uh, and it's not easy to receive tenure at Purdue Engineering. Uh, we would love to uh, give them the opportunity to, to share with us what they did in research, in teaching, in engagement uh, that got us where they are today. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to uh, the two-month-old uh, head, uh, <laughs> uh, the brand new uh, head of the uh, School of Aeronautics and Astronautics, uh, my great colleague and great leader uh, for the AAE school here, uh, Bill Crossley, to introduce the first speaker today. Thank you, Bill. Great, thank you, Mung. Well, welcome, everybody. It's, it's a neat uh, opportunity to be here. I, I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, Dr. Sally Bain. And this is called the Celebration of Associate Professors. And it really is a celebration because while I'm two months and five days into my term as head, Sally is just basically two months because you started at Associate Professor just in August here. So this really is a celebration for Sally. She is recently promoted with tenure. Um, Sally did her undergrad at the University of Virginia and then moved from Virginia out to Pasadena, California and did both her master's and PhD out at Caltech. Did a short postdoc stint there, then came and joined us in 2011 here at Purdue. She's gonna talk about her research. I'm not gonna give those highlights. I just wanted to put in a little personal spin here. I had the pleasure of working with Sally on a project with the Boeing Company a few years ago. It was a very large project to, to try to merge computational data about aerodynamics and experimental data. And because of Sally's role in our undergraduate aerodynamics laboratories, she does a lot of work in the large wind tunnel. And so she was generating some of our experimental data for that fun project. Got one of your students hired at Boeing. And I keep running into pneumonia and she keeps doing better and better. So another example of Sally's great mentorship for her students. And, and one of the fun things is that a few years ago we had celebration of faculty careers and I was introduced as one of the young old guys. <laughs> and so now I get introduced Sally as one of the young middle-aged people. Does that work? I'm there, okay. yeah. Okay, and I'm still one of the Sorry old guys. Say. So with that, let me introduce Professor Sally Bain. Okay, so this is quite a turnout, I um, have to say little nerve-wracking. I'm going to assume you didn't all come to see me. Um, so first of all, it is uh, really a great pleasure to be able to still be here, give this presentation, and to be able to have a career like this at such a wonderful institution. So I didn't come up with a creative um, title for my talk, uh, and I probably have too many slides, so I'll just get right to it. Um, Bill already talked about my background. I got my uh, bachelor's in aerospace engineering at UVA. Um, had to do an undergraduate thesis there because we had a very small program that really got me interested in research and made me realize like this is absolutely what I want to do. I had a great mentor there who helped me get an NSF fellowship which took me to Caltech um, where I did my MS and PhD and I did a one-year postdoc there while I looked for a job and uh, then came here in 2011. Um, and now uh, I'm very excited to be able to continue my career here as an associate and hopefully someday a full professor. So um, I wanted to touch quickly on my research, teaching, and service, um, since those are like the three prongs. Um, as usual, I put too many slides for research, so I'll just try to go through them quickly. So 
My research interests really fall into three areas. Um, experimental combustion, that's the area that I did my PhD in. Um, so I still do some of that work here. Um, I always have to show off this picture here uh, of this giant explosion coming out of the end of my 20-foot explosion tube at Sandia because the, uh, it's a unique facility and the slow-mo guys even came and recorded a video of us annihilating a computer, which I will play at the end of the presentation if there's time. Um, and um, then uh, the other two areas that I spend most of my time on really are plasmas for aerospace applications and then closely tied to that are plasma and flow diagnostics. And that's an area that um, I started becoming interested in when I was at doing my PhD because I got a little bit of exposure to plasmas there. Um, but I, I quickly identified this is a cool area and so when I came to Purdue, I, I really wanted to focus on that and, and sort of establishing my own way in that area. Um, and uh, so far, uh, so far doing okay, apparently. So um, I'm just going to really briefly touch on these. But well, first, uh, what is a plasma? So I apologize if you all already know this, but I, I like this picture. Because people always say, you know, I say I work in plasmas. They go, what is, okay, plasmas. That's my husband thinks it sounds cool because he watches sci-fi and there's lots of plasma drives and plasma warp cores and everything. But I don't work in that kind of plasma, which might be like way up there. Um, so uh, they basically a plasma is just an ionized gas with positive ions and free electrons. And we can have lots of different kinds of plasmas depending on how energetic the electrons are, what the gas temperature is, and um, how many charged particles we have. So I uh, decided uh, to work in the area of what we call cold plasmas, which you can see there with the little circle. Um, they are, you know, 10,000 degrees or less about. There might be some colleagues who are going to argue. Yeah, I see one here who might disagree. But, uh, and um, these are um, really interesting plasmas for a variety of reasons. And the reason that I'm interested in these is because these plasmas, Basically, when they're cold, what we mean is they can be cold, literally. They can be room temperature. But the electrons are much, much hotter. They're very energetic. So you would generate these by applying a very large electric field. So that's what I do. Um, and what happens is these energetic electrons create um, excited molecular states. They dissociate molecules. They ionize molecules. So you have all these really active, excited, energetic particles in your, um, in your gas. And they can also locally heat the gas. And so this actually opens the door for a lot of really interesting interactions between these plasmas and surrounding gases or materials. So, um, and, uh, so they're very chemically active. They can provide localized rapid heating. And they can also provide um, hydrodynamic effects. And plasmas, because it's all electronics, we can turn them on and off practically instantaneously. We can operate them at almost any frequency you can imagine. We can um, uh, generate them with no moving parts. So they really are a, an interesting and promising candidate for a lot of applications that require uh, tailoring of chemistry, for instance, or really fast response time. So what has been really helpful to me, um, tremendously helpful, is the develop the establishment of the cold plasmas team here at Purdue because um, this brought together uh, several very distinguished faculty um, who work in this cold plasmas area into this team, which provided me um, a lot of really valuable mentorship and advocacy for which I'm very grateful. Um, and so this just shows um, like the kind of the range of things that we do on the cold plasmas team. I work primarily in this plasma aerodynamic um, and combustion control, but we have members that work, there's a couple in the audience um, who work on everything from um, treating tumors to um, making plasma antennas. And so this was a um, really important thing for me here um, in helping me to uh, uh, really advance in, in the field is having these, having these mentors for me. Okay, so I know I'm already uh, five or six minutes in, so I'm good. Okay, so um, just a couple slides showing the kind of things I do. So in the plasma and flow diagnostics, 
My goal here at Purdue has been to bring together my capabilities as well as other folks' capabilities. And you can see here there's a whole big list of plasma measurements. And so I do a lot of these myself. I'm collaborating with other faculty with expertise in more advanced diagnostics and how to apply them to plasmas because I want to create here at Purdue like an in-house complete characterization team that um, I don't think exists anywhere else. And then I do a lot of flow diagnostics. This is actually a spark that we're generating between the electrodes. And as you can see, uh, it generates a shock wave and a rather complex flow field. So we do things like particle image VLAS symmetry, Schlieren methods to um, measure the effect of this flow. And so here you're seeing uh, it's not planned anymore, but you're seeing vorticity contours. So um, this is important, particularly for aerodynamic and combustion control. Um, and then two, uh, two slides here on the two applications I'm most interested in. One is plasma flow control, particularly of supersonic flows. So here, this is a wedge in a supersonic Mach 2 flow. We generate plasma here, and this is the baseline flow with a shock wave and a separation zone. And you can see in this little video, when we turn the plasma on, the whole structure moves up quite significantly. OK, so, you know, so what? But that's, what's significant is that this is a high-speed compressible flow that we are affecting with about a watt of electrical power. So this is a rather new area, but um, along with uh, collaborations with my colleagues, we are really focusing on understanding what is the coupling that allows us to have this intrinsic control. Um, and we hope to extend this also to hypersonic flows, which uh, hypersonics is a big um, initiative here at Purdue. Um, and then plasma-assisted combustion. The idea is you use plasma to alter combustion. These are not mine. These are pictures from a few other projects that got me really interested in this, where you can see that when we turn the plasma on, the flame structure changes significantly. So what I've been doing here is developing capabilities state-of-the-art capabilities to study plasma-assisted combustion. So one is this atmosphere pressure burner where we make a swirled flame, um, kind of like a, 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 a gas turbine flame, but a lower power. And we apply a plasma at the exit, and we try to affect the combustion dynamics. And so just a little video, that's what the flame looks like. We generate a plasma, which looks like a fireball, and try to affect the, particularly the stability. And then um, in that, kind of the outlook for that research is um, in collaboration with a colleague in my department, we've um, built this high pressure uh, gas turbine combustor with plasma actuation, where we're going to actually try to demonstrate that we can affect combustion dynamics at gas, at um, engine relevant conditions. And we already have some industry that are giving us some injectors and saying, why don't you give it a try? So. Um, that the outlook for that is, is really promising. And this is a one-of-a-kind facility. Nobody has something like this. So let's hope it works, or I hope it works. Um, I don't, uh, so quickly, so I talk too much about research like everybody does. Um, but teaching, since I came here, I, I've been teaching the fluid mechanics and aerodynamics lab courses in our department. So the, three, the fluid mechanics lab is required course, so I get to, to teach at least 250 students a year um, in that class. Um, this is a picture of our teaching lab where we have all kinds of wind tunnels and experiments for the students to um, get some real world experience. Um, as far as that goes, I, I, I'm really looking forward to hopefully uh, helping to kind of revolutionize the way that we do our lab classes because like many departments, we have a booming enrollment. And I look at lab classes as a chance to give students real practical experience in things that their future employers are going to want to see. Um, so I really hope to stay actively involved with the lab courses um, and to hopefully, we have some plans to implement some virtual labs to change the structure around um, so that uh, we can continue to give our students the best kind of laboratory um, education we can. I also teach graduate aerodynamics. Um, which allows me, uh, we have a, a large uh, uh, undergrad enrollment there too. So, and I also teach that as a distance course. So I've been able to um, meet a lot of students from, from outside of Purdue as well through that. And also, 
that's really forced me to work on my teaching style because if you're teaching to people 500 miles away, you know, you don't want them to turn you off. So, um, so that's, that's really been interesting and I, I hope to continue to improve the curriculum there also to try to um, teach them really what, like we have a lot of students who are out there working and I want to teach them things that they'll actually use when they go back to the office. And finally, last slide, um, service within Purdue, um, different, a few different committees. I, I enjoy doing the Horizons mentoring program for first generation college students. I've done that nearly every semester. I find it really rewarding. Um, I also do a lot of, um, as Bill said, uh, we have a, a big wind tunnel, the Boeing wind tunnel, and I, t I, I enjoy helping a lot of student groups with doing their designing and implementing experiments in that tunnel because they really seem to enjoy it. Um, and then last but not least, outside Purdue, I just listed one thing because my main activities are with a technical committee in AIAA, which um, once again, my mentor has helped me to get a, a seat on that committee. And I've become extremely active in, in or they've appointed me active uh, <laughs> as a chair of every award subcommittee, uh, apparently. I'm not sure how, how it happened, but it's been great for my um, networking and my visibility um, because I, uh, it really uh, gives me a chance, a good excuse to reach out to people and start conversations because I have to ask them to review papers or to session share. So that's been a really wonderful thing. I hope to, I plan to continue doing that and I also hope as an associate professor to get more involved at the college and university level on, on, um, in, in the service aspect. So I think I'm out of time, so that's it. Oh, here, let's see. I'll just play this so nobody asks me any questions. Oh, you, you <laughs> <to show them. laughs> I, I have to, oh, whoops, I meant to mute it, but yes, okay. Uh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> High, highly scientific, I'm sure Sandia, well, Sandia was delighted that we used their uh, <laughs> research team for that. Every graduate student's dream about two months before dissertation defense is like, this is not, boom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's, yeah, so I always have to show that. <laughs> I think we do have a few seconds, well not seconds, a few minutes maybe for questions. I always start a little bit late. I think I'm supposed to walk around and make sure you speak into the microphone since we're recording that. So do people have questions for Sai? I also ought to plug just really quick that uh, we do want you in the aerodynamics lab as long as you're happy doing that. That's a huge <laughs> part of our curriculum. That's, as most schools have grown in size, that's one of our pinch points is how do we get all of our students that exposure? And Sally and her team of teaching assistants have really helped us pull that off. You have questions for Sally? I would ask a simple question. Yes. <laughs> Good. I don't need it. Well, no, they need it. You don't need it. They need it. <laughs> As everybody goes through, goes through this uh, tenure uh, process, how do you balance your family and work? Um, that's a great question. I, I, do, <laughs> I do have two little boys. Um, it was all I could do not to put a picture of them up here because I'm that embarrassing mom. Um, I had them both while I was here. They're two and five. Um, I just made a decision early on that uh, I would be as productive as I possibly could while I was in the office and that, uh, you know, during certain hours, um, I was just going to put my phone away and I was going to interact with my kids. And I try to spend most of my time with them on the weekends. Um, if I have a deadline, of course, all bets are off. But, uh, you know, and I'm sure it's affected my productivity negatively, but the department, you know, I found colleagues are very supportive because they recognize, you know, if you, uh, if you get tenure but you don't see your kids, right, as kind of a, you, you kind of lost. So I just try to, yeah, so I mean, I, I just made a decision that I was going to put them first after working hours unless I had a proposal to write. And then, yeah. So now that you have been a faculty for so long, if you can go back and give an advice to yourself 10 years ago in, in, while you were in graduate school, what advice would you give yourself? When I was in graduate school or when I first started my job? Sorry, either, either or. Um, well, I think it applies everywhere. Um, ask, for, ask for what I need. Um, uh, I, I, uh, same thing in graduate school. It took me a long time to learn to ask my advisor or other graduate students for what I needed. I just did a lot of nodding, like, okay, got it. And I had no idea what anybody was talking about. And then when I got here, I had no idea what I was doing, right, fresh out of graduate school. So I think going to people and saying, I need help. I need advice on this. Will you read this for me? 
Am I doing this right? It took me a really long time and I'm still not very good at it. So I think, um, you know, uh, ask for mentorship, ask for, you know, um, that, that would have been the number one thing I would tell myself. Maybe one more question for? So what's the coolest experiment you guys do in, in your aerodynamics labs to you as the instructor? <sighs> to me, um, I, let's say, hmm. I really like this, we have a little supersonic wind tunnel that's very annoyingly loud if you ever walk by the lab. Um, you can probably hear the squeal. Um, but I, I love that because we, we, we put in like a wedge model and if you guys, anybody, you know, supersonic flow, you're gonna get shock waves and expansion waves. And we just set up some very simple optics and all of a sudden they can see the shocks and expansions. And students always, always find that really, really neat because it's something that you can't see with your eyes. You just sort of write down on paper. Then all of a sudden they're doing an experiment. There they are, they can see them. And not only that, but they actually agree, the answers agree very well with theory. So it's one of those cases where we can tell them like, this is actually, you know, <laughs> it, it, you know, what we're teaching you in the lecture is actually true. So that's, that's my favorite one. The students seem to enjoy that one the most. Hey, please join me and let's celebrate Sally Bean.